Hi, good morning, everybody. This is Bev Ryan from the LinkedIn group, Women Growing Small Business in Australia. So welcome to today's webinar on um, social media. Now, as you may be able to tell, I've got a bit of a head cold, so I'm really happy today. I can just hand over to Mel Kettle, who will take you through the session. So I'll be still looking up for questions in the chat box and um, generally watching the, the control dashboard here. So Mel, it's over to you. Oh, thanks, Bev. Hi, everyone. Uh, Lisa and Kim, I see you're on the call and one phone person. Hello to you, mystery person. Um, I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes and so we'll allow about 15 minutes for questions. So um, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat box and I'll come back to them at the end. So we're talking today about how to use social media to effectively recruit, retain and engage with clients. So I'm just going to um, push the right button to move through, uh, have a quick chat about an introduction to social media, um, tell you how some, some ways to be heard by your market and connect with your clients, what channels you have to use, the difference between sales and building trust on social media, and then how to create contagious content. So the first thing that you need to be mindful of is that social media is social. It's not about sales. It's about building relationships and it's about getting to know people and having them get to know you. Because as we all know, people do business with people they know, like and trust. And social media provides a lot of opportunities to build trust with people and, to, um, and then from trust the sales can come. So business, to be, so business is no longer B2B, B2C. It's all about people to people and it's about building those relationships with people. I've developed a little model to explain this. So when you're first um, starting out on social media, you're usually just observing and you're observing what it is, how it works. And this is the same whether you're starting on social media for the first time or whether you're starting to use a new channel to you. And the benefit of the observation aspect is that you're learning. So you're learning how it works. You're learning who's on there. You're learning some of the norms and, you know, some of the behaviours that people um, partake in. Once you've moved on from that observing stage, then most people start broadcasting and in that stage, you're promoting yourself. So you're sharing the message that you want people to know about you and you want what you want people to um, take away about you and your organisation. And engagement in this phase is quite low. It's also all about one-way communication at this time. You're talking to other people. They're not, they might be trying to talk to you, but you're not talking back. So it's more about you just getting your message out, very much like the old school way of media was where... Um, you know, you sent a media release out and people would find out about you through mass media, so through TV, radio, print. The next step in the model is you start to have conversations and once you're a bit more comfortable with the broadcasting aspect of it, then you might start to have a few, um, say hello to some people, comment on what they've posted, people will comment on what you've posted and you might start... Um, you know, just having some fairly simple conversations. And the benefit of this is that you're getting to be known. So you're getting to be known above and beyond what it is that you're just broadcasting. And you can start to notice that your engagement with your audience is starting to ramp up at this stage. And this can often have a flow on effect to your organ to your business. Then the next step is you start to build relationships because as you know, once you start to have a conversation with people and you get to know them, then you start to feel like you've got some sort of a relationship with them and you start to like them. And again, this moves your relationships um, and your engagement up to that next level as well. And then finally, you've generated some trust and you're collaborating with people. And this is um, sort of the pinnacle of social media use where people come to you, ask you questions, you might start working together on a project, you might notice that in your Facebook group that other people might ask a question of you but other members of the group might respond. And this is where engagement um, with your organisation is really at a, at, at a really high level particularly compared to when you first start out with social media where you don't really have any engagement. I liken this relationship um, and this building of the know, like and trust to dating. So this is a picture of me with my beloved. When, we, when you first meet somebody, you, you know, 
let me take a step back. When you first start thinking about having a relationship, you might just have a look and see who's out there. So you might sign up to an online dating platform, you might go to a bar, and you might just sort of have a bit of a look around who who might I be interested in. And then after that, you might start to broadcast that you're available. And if you're on an online dating platform and having a look, then you might put your profile up. If you're in a bar, if you're going out to a bar or if you're going out with some friends for a night, you might get dressed up and you might put a bit more effort into your appearance. So you're broadcasting, hey, I'm here, I'm available. And then you might start to chat to somebody and have a conversation. You get to know them a little bit, then you get to like them a little bit, and then you get to trust them. And once you've built that trust, then quite often you might find yourself in a committed relationship or you might take that ultimate step of moving in together or getting married. It's also a bit like um, marriage in that you wouldn't marry somebody on a first date unless you're on a really bad reality TV show. And social media is a lot like that. You can't expect to suddenly jump into social media land and have everybody immediately buying your product. You have to start to build that relationship. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, mention something in the chat box and I'll try and explain it no, a little bit. That's fine, more no, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> so the one thing I struggle with with webinars is you don't get that feedback because you can't see the mm. look of recognition in the audience's face. Yes. <laughs> I'm watching the chat, the chat box, everything's good, and that makes great, great sense. Excellent. So there's a few things that you need to think about with social media and with communication in general. You want to get the right message to the right people using the right channel. And I liken this to fly fishing. Pull up my next screen. Um, because when you go fly fishing, and I have not quite gone fly fishing, but I've tried to with my uncle in Scotland. Unfortunately, the weather was appalling, so we went to the pub instead. <laughs> but he said to me, he was teaching me how to do. He was teaching me how to how to um make some flies or tie some flies. And he said, you've got the best chance of catching a salmon when you've got the right fly and you've got the right rod to cast the right fly and you've got to hit, you know, cast it in the right spot at the right time. And communication is very much like that. Um, bad communication is just the result of people who don't know when and how to use the right flies or how to use the right messages to the right channel. Um, and so, when you fly fish the wrong way, you scare the fish away. And when you communicate the wrong way, you scare your potential clients away. <laughs> that always makes me laugh, that analogy, because <laughs> my uncle had said to me, he lives in northern England, and he'd said to me, oh, let's go fishing for the day a couple of days down the track. And I was so excited because I'd never been to Scotland, which is where we were going, and I'd never been fly fishing. And we woke up the morning that we were going to go and the weather was atrocious. And so he said to me, well, we can still go, but we'll be standing in cold water in the rain. Or instead, why don't we go to Whitby and go to the pub and have fish and chips for lunch? I went, yes, let's do that. <laughs> so he served me my first Guinness when I was 21 that day and it was just fantastic. I just want to share with you all a few little stats around Australian social media use. If you haven't checked out the Census Social Media Report, definitely pop that on your list. And it's um, if you just Google Census Social Media Report, you'll find it. They do an absolutely brilliant social media report every year. And it looks at the state of play of use and from a business perspective, as well as from a consumer perspective in Australia. It's really um, hard to get good Australian data around social media use and these guys do a great job, not just about how, who uses it and how it's used, but also about attitudes around use. So their survey this year showed that 99% of us have an internet-enabled device and we average three each, which sounds like a lot until you work it out. So in our house, we've got about 10 internet-enabled devices by the time you add up the phones, the iPads and the computers and the TV. 81% of us in 2017 or in the 2017 survey results own a smartphone, which is an increase of 76% from last year. 84% of us access the internet every day and 79% of us use social networking sites. Now, this is quite a big increase from last year where it was only 69%. 
um, of that percentage, 56 of us check social media more than five times a day, which is a massive increase from the 26% that checked more than five times a day last year. Um, they also, the data also showed that of the 79% of us that use social networking sites, 94% use Facebook. Now that's just huge. It really shows that if you don't have a Facebook presence as a business, then you're potentially missing a lot of opportunity. Now, I am going to remind everybody that Facebook isn't the be all and end all for every type of business and for every organisation. But if you work in the B2C space, then you definitely need to consider having a social a Facebook page. The second most popular social networking site that people, that Australians use is Instagram. 46% of us on social media have an Instagram account and that's followed by um, Snapchat, which I think is 40% and Twitter, which is about 32%. And LinkedIn is quite low. It's about 18 or maybe 20%. The other thing that this report showed, but more importantly, um, another report I read from Social Media Examiner. Social Media Examiner is an American organisation. They interview or survey about 3,500 marketing professionals every year. And their report that came out this year showed that visual content is, more, is the most important type of content that we can share on social media. This is kind of groundbreaking because up until this year or this survey, the answer when they asked the question, what's the most important type of social media content that you share, the answer was always a blog. So visual content has overtaken blogging as the most important form of social media. And I'll talk a little bit later about how you can use that more effectively um, when you're creating content. Oops. It's also really important that you identify the right social media platforms for your organisation. And as you can see from this social media landscape diagram, you've got a lot of choice. There's different purposes for different social media platforms. So you need to work out what's right for you and what's right for your organisation. If you're marketing to mums, then Facebook is probably where you need to be um, and possibly also Pinterest and Instagram. If you're primarily B2B, then LinkedIn is probably where you need to be playing. And also don't forget Facebook because Social Media Examiner report this year also said that marketers are using Facebook more than LinkedIn and for their um, social media interactions. And again, this is the first year that Facebook has beaten out LinkedIn in terms of use. And with B2B marketers saying that they're spending a lot more time on Facebook because they're getting a lot more traction. Anyone, and Bev, you'll probably agree with me here, anybody who's tried to create a group on LinkedIn and has a group for the same people on Facebook will know that Facebook groups are so superior to LinkedIn groups in terms of ease of use and mm. um, the conversations and the traction that happen within. Yeah, definitely. I was looking for this LinkedIn group last night. I couldn't even find where my groups were. It just mm, it's, they've <laughs> it's so non <laughs> Yeah, That's right. They're hidden the way you find them. Yeah. So, so if you are B2B and you're not using Facebook, just have a look and, and see and ask your market, are they on Facebook and do they use it for business purposes? Because it might be a channel that's going to provide opportunity for you now and into the future. So I want to talk a little bit now about how to be heard by your market and how to connect with your clients. Three great ways are to ask for feedback, to have conversations and to ask for influences. 51% of customers expect companies to ask them for feedback directly, whether it's over the phone, via your website or via a survey um, or via a social media channel. So if you're not asking your customers for feedback, then have a think about how you can because they expect it. They also, and some of the types of feedback that you can be asking for are things like, how can we improve our experience here? How could we improve our service? What products or services do you want that we don't currently offer? And unless people are asked directly, it's a really small microscopic percentage that will give you feedback. 
don't think that asking for feedback means that you're going to be bombarded with negative feedback because that's definitely not the case. There's research that shows when people are asked for feedback, they're equally likely to give positive feedback versus negative feedback. So you might get some really pleasant surprises. But also, you know, people leave feedback because they want to be a part of the process. The fact that people are taking time to give you feedback, whether it's asked for or unsolicited, shows that they actually care about your organisation. The last thing you want is to be providing crappy service and crappy products to people who are just sucking it up and not saying anything, or even worse, going to another organisation to get those products and services. So think about what you can ask. We've talked about having conversations. Having conversations is one of the absolute best ways that you can connect with your market and be heard by them. And, you know, think about conversations that aren't all business related. It's just as important to have that social conversation. You know, how's the weather? What do you think of, um, you know, uh, what do you think of The Bachelor last night on TV? You know, look, talk about social norms and social activities and, you know, world events as well as business things. A colleague of mine ran a winery in Canberra and she opened the winery around about the time of the GFC. And during the GFC, the demand for their product skyrocketed and she attributes that directly to building relationships with people on Twitter. Because as she said, there's not much to do in Canberra at night in winter. TV is crap and it's cold. So you don't really want to go outside. And they lived about a half an hour drive from from Canberra so you know roads aren't that great at night when it's wet as well so she just thought I'll oh, just check out what Twitter is and start she just started meeting people having conversations because she talked a lot about wine and food and because she owned a winery that also had a cellar door and a restaurant she built a lot of relationships with people who shared her passion and her love of those types of things and so when times were getting tougher a lot of the, the wine reps and a lot of the um, sommeliers of restaurants would continue to do business with her over some of the big people because they said to her, we feel like we know you and we feel like we're friends and we want to support people that we know and that we like and that we trust because we don't want you, you know, to struggle in business. And that to me is just one of the best examples of having conversations and building relationships she also talked a lot about, you know, what she was watching on TV and what she was reading, and that helped to build those relationships as well in a more personal way. And then the third way that's great, a great way of being heard with your market and connecting with your clients is to use influencers. And when I say influencers, I don't necessarily mean celebrities. I mean people who are known in your space. And when you're choosing which influencers to use, make sure that they've got credibility with your market. And so it could be, you know, it could just be leaders in the field. It could be, um, it, it, you know, it could be people who use your products. It could be raving fans of yours. So have a think about, you know, who is it that provides you with feedback and what influence might they have? And, have a look at, you know, their social media accounts and see, do they refer things and do they, um, are they people who like to connect? And if they are, then chances are they've got a degree of influence amongst their, their network. And so approach them to see whether or not they might be interested in having a more formal influencer relationship with you. I'm not going to go too much into that because we're running it, we don't have a huge amount of time, but I'm certainly happy to chat about the power of influences um, at a later stage if anybody's interested. I think I've talked a little bit about this. These are some of the questions to ask when you're um, wanting to get some feedback from your, from your audience or from your market. Um, the other things that you need to think about is what are your competitors doing on social media? What do they... Uh, I'm actually a little bit ahead of myself here. I'm reading the questions. So these are questions to ask yourself, not questions to ask your, your um, audience. These are questions to ask yourself before you start looking at social media or once you're using social media. So have a think about what are some of your objectives of using social media? What is it that you want to achieve? 
who is your audience and where are they? And this will help you identify which platforms you should be using. What resources do you have to invest? What time, how much time do you have to spend using social media? Um, how much money do you have to spend? How much knowledge do you have that you can tap into? And if you need to hire somebody to manage your social media for you, then how much money can you afford to, to pay somebody else to help you out? Um, think about what are your competitors doing on social media? What are some of the great stuff that they're doing? Are they even there? If they're not there, then just being on there will give you a competitive advantage. And I know there's a lot of industries where quite often competitive, quite often um, businesses just don't have a social media presence or have a very small social media presence. And in fact, in Australia, something like 50% of businesses in Australia, are small to medium sized businesses don't have any social media presence at all. So just being there is a massive advantage um, in many spaces with many industries. In terms of creating content, have a think about what content do you already have and what content can you create? That, just don't try, try not to get too um, panicked about the thought of creating a lot of content because a general rule of thumb with content and sharing content is that for every 10 pieces, you should probably create two or three of those yourself. At least six of them should be curated content from other people, which makes it quite easy to find um, and quite easy to share. And then one or two pieces of those 10 pieces can be a blatant sales pitch. Don't make it all about sales. You really want your content to be useful and valuable. And the best content that you can be providing and creating answers the questions that your clients have. So have a think about what are the problems that your clients have and how can you solve them and create content that will help them solve their problem. Mark Schaefer, who's one of my absolute favourite marketing people, and he writes a fantastic blog that if you're not reading it, you should definitely have a look at it. It's called um, Business Grow. He says, be more human in every engagement and every comment. And the reason that you need to be more human is because that builds trust and authority. And when you build trust and authority, people are more inclined to feel valued. So have a think about, well, how can I say this politely? Around the 1st of April, healthcare, um, everyone that has private healthcare will know that the 1st of April is when your insurance premiums go up. How does it make you feel when you see ads on TV from your healthcare provider saying, we'd like new people to join our fund and for everybody who's new who joins in the next week or the next month or by this date, we'll get this for free. I know this year I received a letter from Bupa, my healthcare provider, saying your premiums are going up by, I don't know, some ridiculous amount, $30 a month or whatever it was. Um, and then they had these ads on TV for all these great things. So clearly somebody in Bupa had thought, okay, we need to... Um, do something to placate our current members. So I received a letter from them, another letter saying, thank you for being a valued Booper customer. We've put you in a drawer to win $200 worth of products from Speedo. And I looked at that and thought, really? You've put me in a drawer to win $200 worth of products from Speedo. Why don't you give me a discount to buy Speedo products or why don't you just give me $200 worth of Speedo products because $200 is less than my monthly premium with you. <laughs> Can anyone relate to that? Mm, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I mean about making your customers feel value. Think about how you can um, exceed their expectations online and offline with your customer care. I've got a couple of examples, which I will just zip on through to. This is one of my absolute favorite examples. This is a guy from um, the US, a guy called Eric Tung. 
when he goes to hotel, he stays in hotels a lot, he travels a lot, and he always fills in those little extra request boxes. And so this is the outcome of the extra request box that he filled in when he went to the Grand Hyatt in San Diego to go to a conference a couple of years ago. He said, I would like a picture of a pickle and a piece of chocolate. And so when he turned up into his room, they gave him this picture of a pickle and they said, you know, here at the Manchester Grand Hyatt, San Diego, we want to make sure your needs aren't just met, they're exceeded. Have fun colouring the pickle and enjoy your time at the conference. Now, this has been retweeted a few hundred times. It's been liked by lots of people. He's got about 100,000 Twitter followers. So, you know, a lot of people saw this and you might just think, oh, yeah, that's great. He's... Um, you know, he, he uses this in examples of conferences as well. What I love even more was that a week or two later, he went to stay at another hotel. The other hotel gave him this. And this, you know, with a note that says, we heard you like pickles and chocolate. Um, am I doing this right? <laughs> <laughs> So he responded with this photo on Twitter saying, update, residents and Amelia may have one up to the Grand Hyatt San Diego. They left this in my room. And they're like, no, no, no one upping. We're just inspired by them. Now, how much is that providing mm. a better experience? How much is that exciting and delighting him? <laughs> I think about how can you use social media to excite and delight your customers? Do you think he felt valued? when he stayed at these two hotels, they listened to his request and they followed up. Now, I don't know whether they would have done this had they not realised how many hundreds of thousands of followers he has on social media or how influential he was, but I like to think that they would have. Compare this to another American company called Cracker Barrel. Earlier in the year, or towards the end of last year, Cracker Barrel fired Brad's wife. I don't know why. Allegedly, Brad doesn't know why. But Brad sent a tweet, sent a, put a message on Cracker Barrel's Facebook page saying, why did you fire my wife? Particularly, why did you fire her the day before her anniversary of working with you, which meant that she couldn't get her holiday bonus? Cracker Barrel have never responded publicly. If you hop onto their Facebook page, you will see every single time Cracker Barrel Old Country Store put something on their Facebook page, there are comments about why was Brad's wife fired? Well, Brad's wife was fired a really long time ago and yet they have never addressed it in any comment. It's getting a bit beyond a joke now, but have a think about how can you um, not be like Cracker Barrel and be more like the Grand Hyatt San Diego. What you're wanting to do is create loyalty. Oops. And there's research that shows across a wide range of industries, a 5% improvement in customer service will give you a 25 to 100% increase in profits. So think about how can you use customer service more effectively across social media. Jay Bear, who's quite um, a well-known marketing person as well, has said social customer service is a customer spectator sport. And what he means by that is that when, think about your own experience with service and social media, when you have amazingly awesome service, you want to tell people about it. When you have amazingly awful service, you want to tell people about it. You don't want to tell people about the meh. You just want to tell people about the really good and the really bad. And if you do it publicly, then everybody can see, you know, what you are thinking, but also form their own opinion of that brand. So as a brand or as a business, if people are critiquing your service in a public way, you really need to respond. And if it's a particularly bad service that they're critiquing, then you can just say, thanks very much for your feedback. Let's have a conversation about this online. But it's really important that it's acknowledged. And we need to remember as well that better service isn't unique, but a better experience is. So think about back to the example with Eric and his two hotels. He has, you know, he's probably always had really good service 
at the Hyatt and at um, the other hotel that he stayed at. But has he had a better experience than the one that he's had in the last, with those last two visits? I want to give the example as well of a friend of mine who lives in Canada but spends five months of the year in Arizona to get away from the cold winters in Canada. They went to visit a new dentist when they were in Arizona and had some fairly big dental work done. So the husband and the wife both did. Um, and they got this letter from the dentist about a week later. And it says, Tom and Linda, just a note to say, it was great having you two in the office for your dental appointments. Thanks very much for your trust and cooperation. If you have any questions, give me a call. And we look forward to your next dental visits. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had a card from any healthcare provider that I've ever seen. They are absolutely going to be going back to this dentist because he cared enough to write this card, which made them feel valued and appreciated. They're also going back because, you know, it was a lot cheaper than their dentist options in Canada, but they're in Arizona in Phoenix where there are, there's practically a dentist on every street corner in Phoenix. So think about how you can do little things like that, both online and offline, to make your customers feel valued. I want to talk next about how to create and leverage content that your clients will value. We've all had a really bland and boring and tasteless meal, a bit like this one. And creating bland and boring content makes you feel like you're having a meal without salt. So think about how you can create content that's got some pizzazz like this. Our attention span today is shorter than a goldfish. So you really need to be creating content that can cut through the clutter. And given that today we also have a bit of an obsession with mobile phones, we also need to be mindful of how can we optimise our content to be seen on a small screen. People look at their mobile phones more than 1,500 times a week or 177 minutes a day. And that's nearly three hours a day staring at your phone. So think about the content that you look at on your phone, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Instagram, on any of the other social platforms that you use and have a look to see what is it that stands out on the small screen? What types of images work? What colours stand out? What font stands out? Is your blog opt or your website optimised for mobile? Because far too many aren't. And let me tell you, if you have an e-commerce store on your website and that is not optimised for mobile, do you think people are going to buy from you? No, they will probably not. Because it's really, really difficult. Um, think as well, does your blog have a pop-up or does your website have an annoying pop-up that comes up on a mobile phone? Because again, it's often really, really difficult to turn off a pop-up on a phone. And as of, I think, last year, either earlier this year or the end of last year, Google are now punishing websites in SEO rankings that have pop-ups that appear on mobile phones. So just think about how you can make your content look more um, creative. And so what do we need to do? We need to be creating contagious content. This is a little picture of a blown up H1N1 virus, which is one of the most contagious viruses. Do you like what I did there? <laughs> Fascinated by health as well. So I had to include that one. Um, but what we need to do is we need to use our content to educate and to entertain and inspire. And we can do that by creating better content, by providing you know, various sources of our content. So not just our own content, but curating content, telling stories, using video. As I've said before, customer service is essential, both online and offline. We need to be authentic um, and we need to acknowledge that it's actually, it's okay to make mistakes. Nobody expects us to be perfect. So have a think about the last time you looked on TripAdvisor or Urban Spoon or an online um, rating system or even on Amazon if you're looking for a book or some music to download, did you trust those places that had only five-star reviews? Because I see somewhere that's only got five-star reviews and I think, oh, they've just been paid. Someone's paid for those. If I see a rating that has a, a mix of, you know, 
reviews from one star to five star, I think, yeah, that's a lot more authentic because, and that, and that shows that, you know, they haven't just bought all of their reviews. So have a think about that the next time you're, you make a mistake on social, um, you know, just own the mistake and, you know, admit to it and talk about how you're going to, um, you know, what, what you've learned from that. Don't be a Lorna Jane and cover up your mistakes. <laughs> Experience is that perfect mix of service, opportunity and conversations. And it's really um, something that you need to be considering with the content that you're creating. My favourite example of and one of my favourite pieces of content is this ad. I'm sorry, it's a little bit blurry, I think, on your screen. But this was um, a tweet and a Facebook post that came out a couple of years ago during the 2013 Super Bowl in the US. The football stadium was blacked out for 34 minutes. And so everybody was turning to social media to find out what was happening. And Oreo were aware that everybody would be looking at Twitter and Facebook to see what was going on. So they created this message. And about seven minutes after the stadium blacked out, this came across Twitter and Facebook. You can see that it was retweeted. Well, this is from the, the, the day that it happened. And it was retweeted nearly 16,000 times. It was shared some phenomenal number of times on Facebook. Um, and it's really had huge traction. So this one very, very clever, very creative post was, it's estimated that it was seen by 525 million people, which isn't quite impressive, given that approximately 50 million people turned on their TV to actually watch the Super Bowl. Mm, now, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Now, the reason this worked was because it was really timely, it was really clever, and it was really creative. They also had the perfect storm in that they had the creative director was in the room with the decision makers at Oreo watching the game. And so when it happened, he just went, we've got to do something. And he had the right people there to make the decision, um, the approval decisions there and then with him. So it was really easy for it to just um, be done and put up. But still... I don't know how many brands, well, you know, not, not many brands thought to do something like this um, in that moment and to take advantage of that moment. So this worked. It worked because it stood out on mobile, because it's quite clear. Um, most things on mobile are colour and very vibrant. And so a black and white, it just stands out a lot more. It worked out because it was very visible on multi-screens and when people watch TV and when people watch a sporting event, they're often looking at multiple screens while they're doing it and commenting. Um, and they really just shared it on the right platform at the right time and they had the right message. So going back to our um, fly fishing example of our, you know, the, th the three things you need to do, you need to have the right content for the right um the right message for the right people on the right platform and they really succeeded with that. Another example I love, um, which also uses visuals, is this one here from the tax office. But you never thought I would hold up the tax office as a best practice way of using social media. This post um, was on Facebook and it came out on the 17th of July, which was the day that Game of Thrones launched on Foxtel with the new season. Mm -hmm. It's clever, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, the ATO planned this. It wasn't something that they were reacting to. It was something that they put a lot of thought into and thought, how can we take advantage of this? Um, and if you just look at their Facebook feed, they are so clever in anticipating social um, interest in what's going on in the world. So they're just, they're just smart. Um, but if you look at the little blurb at the top, you know, they say watching Game of Thrones, so they tag Game of Thrones. You can also see on the right-hand side that they're, they respond to people really quickly. So they, you know, they've really got it all going on at the moment. Um, they have the advantage of having an in-house graphic designer who they can work with to create this sort of thing. But they're, they're, they've, I just can't speak highly enough of how much their social media has improved over the last few years. They're very visual, um, which is really important given how, many, how important visual is these days with social media. But they're also, um, you know, they've just 
they're really good at at tapping into what's going on and relating it back to what their audience needs and can relate to. Another great way of creating contagious content is to create video. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this video of Chewbacca Mum, but she is phenomenal. Um, I'm not going to play it because we're running out of time a little bit, but Google it and watch it. It has been shared 167, no, sorry, it's been viewed 167 million times and it's been shared 3.3 million times. Now, she, again, it was kind of the perfect storm. She posted this just after Facebook Live started and Facebook saw how um, much it was resonating with her audience and how many people in her, like how many of her friends were sharing it and they really helped her push that through but what I love about this video and you'll love it when you watch it is she's so authentic and she's so herself and she pokes a bit of fun at herself um, but she's just she just has fun and I think that is key to using video is just you know show your personality as a brand and show your um, show that you know who you are and you're comfortable in your own skin as an organisation and the people who are representing your organisation. And that's what Candace Payne does so incredibly well on this video. A few other things about video that are really important to realise is that if, you're, if you have a product, if you sell a product that does something and it's a little bit difficult to work out how it works, do a video. Four times as many people would rather watch a video about how something works than read instructions. So think about, um, you know, when you're building an Ikea piece of furniture. We've all done that and we've all struggled with those little instructions. I've never thought to YouTube watching somebody how to do it, and I don't even know if there's videos, but I'm sure there are, but it would be so much better to understand how I had to put it together or, you know, how my husband gets to put it together. <laughs> He's even worse than I am. Um, and it would save so much time if you could see. There's also research that shows more people want to see more video. You also need to be aware that when most people watch video on Facebook, they watch it without sound. So if you need to have the sound en enabled, then make sure that your first slide on your video says, turn on the sound. Um, and if you, and also think about how can you add subtitles. Facebook users now spend three times more time watching Facebook Live than watching traditional videos. So if you haven't jumped onto Facebook Live yet and started to have a bit of a play with that, then think about how you can use it in your organisation and how your clients can use it as well. And you can use Facebook Live now on a personal profile, a page and in a group. Um, and you can also do Facebook Live from a desktop, not just from a device. Advice I give to my clients is if they're a bit anxious about it, set up a group and the only person in the group is you and practice using Facebook Live that way. If it works well, you can always save it and share it across other pages and groups and profiles. You can also save um, Facebook Live videos and pop them up on YouTube if you want to. The Facebook algorithm pushes Facebook Live videos and all videos to the top of a feed. And when you start a Facebook Live, it notifies your friends and your um, members of your page and on your group that you're starting a Facebook Live. So there's no other kind of content on Facebook in particular that draws people's attention to it immediately. So have a think about how you can um, be using it. And don't think you need fancy expensive stuff to either do Facebook Live or other video. You can just create amazing video on your phone and you can also you know, just get a cheap tripod I use a selfie stick that I ripped apart to um, attach my phone to the tripod. You know, that little doobie bit that you put your phone, clip your phone into. I've just pulled it off a selfie stick that I never used, screwed it into a tripod. I've bought a lapel microphone that fits into my phone. Um, and I just use that to make sure the sound quality is quite good. So, you know, it doesn't need to be expensive. You don't need to have a lot of time. You just need to make sure that you've got a good a good internet connection and good light. Um, the latest post on my blog at melkettle.com is on how to use video, how to create great video on your smartphone. So have a look at that if you just need some ideas. 
the other thing you want your social media to do is you want it to be inspiring. This is the Instagram page of Founder Magazine and you can see this is indicative of all of their posts. It's just inspirational quotes, some of them overlaid on images, some of them just on um, black text on white. They also show, share the latest cover and a bit of information about what's in their latest magazines, but they keep it really simple. They have a million Instagram followers. So think about you know, how you can share inspiring information as well. If you're a bit stuck with Instagram and you're not sure how to use it to build a following, Nathan Chan from Founder Magazine has also created this amazing resource. If you just Google um, Founder Magazine Instagram and it's founder with no E, F-O-U-N-D-R, um, and then you can access that free resource that he has created and it's just excellent. It's also really important with your social that you're authentic. I went to see Adele on her Sunday night show in Brisbane and she was amazing. And I've been a fan of hers ever since I first heard of her when her first album came out. And I fell in love with her even more when she was on stage because she was dive bombed by bogong moths, which are a curse of Brisbane in summer. And she danced around the stage squealing like a three-year-old saying, I can't believe that there's all these moths. Are they going to kill me? <laughs> and it just endeared her even more to every single person in the stadium because it was her true authentic self. And what I love about her is that, and there's so many lessons that she can teach us in business about being real, you know, being authentic is about doing what you promise. It's about listening to your audience and being responsive. It's about being honest about your products and services. It's about owning mistakes that you make. It's about using language that your audience understands. So try not to use too much corporate jargon. And it's about being consistent with your messaging. Um, and it's about being original and about being yourself. So I think about how you can be more authentic with your social media posts and the content that you create. I really like this quote from Steve Jobs. Um, Get closer than ever to your customers, so close that you tell them what they need well before they realise it themselves. If you can do that, then you're really providing an excellent customer service. One of my favourite Twitter accounts in terms of customer service is this one from KLM Airlines. If you click on their Twitter account, um, once I finish, not while I'm talking, thank you, um, have a look and see and you will see at the, top of their, um, at the top of their account in the banner at the top, it will tell you how many minutes you have to wait if you ask them a question. I don't know anybody else who does this on social media and I think this is just so incredibly clever. I look at this every few days to see if I sent them a question, how long would I have to wait? And the shortest I've had to wait would be three minutes for a response and the longest I've had to wait would be about 30 minutes. But they set the expectation and that is what I like about it because it is so frustrating to tweet a brand or put something about... Um, ask a question of a brand on Facebook or Instagram or on any other social media and to know and to think how long am I going to have to wait for them to get back to me? This mitigates that. So think about how can you do something like this to help um, manage the expectation of your customers on social media. And then the third way that we can all be um, creating great content is to tell a story. People love stories and people relate to stories and your stories, they need to be engaging and they need to have a purpose and they need to relate to your work and the messages that you want to portray. So think about, um, you know, what stories do you have in your organisation that you can share with your customers? And it can be things like, you know, your personal story, how your business started, how you, um, I don't know, <laughs> day-to-day -day stories as well as bigger picture stories. There's a great example of a fantastic um, website and I can't remember the name of it. Let me just have a quick look through my notes to see if I can find it. Um, and they do amazing stories and they are called, they are called, they are called, they are called Saddleback Leather. 
So have a look at saddlebackleather.com and they have the best stories. They have fantastic videos on their site as well. But just go and check them out. This is another story that I love. This was on Facebook a week or two ago. And this is just, it's not a brand, it's just this guy, but he's got a great story. And he just shared some pictures of he and his wife on their date night. And what I love about it is that it's really authentic. But this has been shared about 400,000 times now. And <laughs> because people really relate to their story. Now, I'm really hoping that Goodwill have come into this and, you know, taken part of been part of the party and um offered to do you know if i was goodwill i'd be having little sections in my store saying going on a date night here's some outfits you could think about wearing um so have a look at this have a read of this they've got a blog post as well that they've written about but it's just this young couple they've got a young baby and every now like once a week once every couple of weeks they'll have a date night and they try to make it interesting so they on this night they went to their local goodwill or you know saint vinnie's gave themselves a budget of ten dollars each had to find the most dire outfit ever and then wear it out on their date it's hysterical read their blog post you will laugh so hard they're great but this is a great story and this is what i mean about sharing stories that are engaging the other thing you need to think about is, you know, create, when you've created your one piece of content, think about where else can you share it? So you don't want to just write a blog post and then only have it sit on your blog. I love this example of Taco Bell because they have, these are the only ingredients. There's, I think there's 15 or 16 ingredients here and this is all they make everything in their store with. And if you have a look on their website, this is half of the burritos that you can get. And they've also got this many tacos and this many chimichangas and this many flavours of 27 other different things. But they've got something like 250 different menu items made from those 15 ingredients. So think about how can you take your, your core piece of content and how can you convert that into a lot of different ingredients, for want of a better word, or a lot of different recipes. So how can you share it on Facebook? How can you... What bits of it can you take out and put as a text overlay on a compelling image that you can share on Instagram and Twitter? Can you convert it into a podcast? Can you convert it into a slide share? Can you convert it into um, articles for other publications? Can you rewrite it and put it on Medium or on LinkedIn or on other groups that you might be in? Like how can you really leverage that one piece of content so that it works and, um, you know, earns its keep because it's a lot of effort to write a piece of content, particularly a good piece of content. So make sure it's shared as widely and as broadly as you possibly can. And then finally, I just want to remind you that when you create content, create it where you own it. It's all very well to write a beautiful long Facebook post or Instagram post and put it only on Facebook and Instagram, but you have no control over those platforms. So when you're writing content, put it on your blog or create a podcast with it or put it on your YouTube channel. But make sure that where you keep and store that content is somewhere that you own. Because if Facebook closed tomorrow, like Vine closed recently, you, have, you could potentially lose everything if you don't store it somewhere else. And also think about, you know, with your content, ideally you want to be using that to drive people to your website, to drive people to your YouTube channel, to drive people to a podcast. So you want to be creating your content in a way and sharing it in a way that gets people back so that they can find out more about you. And that's all I have. So cool. I'm happy to take questions. Well, Mel, just can you tell us um, a little bit more about how you help businesses yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. So I um, primarily work with businesses to help them. I primarily work with associations at the moment mm -hmm. um, and other um, small to medium-sized organisations to help them understand how they can communicate and use social media to attract, retain and engage clients. And that's um, through delivering, developing strategies with them, running training in-house, skilling up their staff and um, providing them with um, ongoing mentoring and coaching. 
Fantastic. So what's your background? How did you get into this? Oh, my background. Um, I've been working in marketing for about 20 years, mm -hmm. more than 20 years now. I've got um, my first degree at uni was a Bachelor of Tourism Management with a marketing major. Yes. And my first job for a few years was organising conferences um, oh. for associations. And so we did everything for the conference from the marketing through to, to mm -hmm. the logistics. And then I um, moved to Brisbane and worked as the marketing manager for the Brisbane Festival for a year and then worked in government um, in communication roles, educating and um, informing customers or consumers and businesses about their rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. under lots of different pieces of legislation. Right. And 11 years ago, I started consulting. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So if anyone's got a question, just pop it into either the chat box or there is a Q&A box there as well. So I'm checking both of them. Um, I, I think, yeah, go on. Pop my contact details up. So right. if you think of questions later, just get in touch, mm. just shoot me an email or... Um, um, tweet me or follow me on Facebook or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Happy I to, think happy to chat. one of the biggest problems for business owners, I think, and is to uh, is just when we do all this, when do we do it? So, do you think it works if you outsource your social media management? Do you think that would work? No, I don't. I think no. there's a lot of things you can outsource with social media. So you can outsource um, getting some help to create a strategy and getting mm -hmm. some help. To create a content schedule, but mm -hmm. you really need to be engaging with your clients and your customers on social yourself. Mm -hmm. So and get some help in, you know, scheduling posts sure. um, and, sure. and writing some content and creating some content. But in terms mm -hmm. of that ongoing engagement, somebody within the organisation needs to be doing it. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, come back to my dating analogy, it's like organising to go on a date with somebody but sending your friend. Mm. <laughs> it's true. Um, you yeah. just you need to be the one building that relationship. Um, a couple of times I've I've um, asked people to create images for me to use with text, and I've read it. You know, read them, and that's not me. You know, I wouldn't say yeah. that. It was just yeah. glaringly obvious. So yeah, it's a tough mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. It is. It is, but you know, there's lots of tools that make it easier for you. So, in terms of creating great images, I'm a big user of Canva. Yeah, um, I love Canva. which is an online yeah. tool. There's another one called Easel, E A S I L dot com, and that's very similar to Canva. That's fantastic as well. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what else do I do? I use a scheduling tool as well. So I like um, Meet Edgar because you can create a library of your content and it just revolves through. So what did you call um, What is that? I Meet Edgar. Meet Edgar. Meet Edgar. Oh, yeah. It's days. quite expensive, but okay. it saves me so much time every mm -hmm. month. Great. Yeah. And then there's a new one out as well, which apparently um, is quite similar to Meet Edgar, which I'm going to start trialling as well. And I'll pop mm -hmm. the name of it group um i can't remember it offhand i've just heard about it in the last week or so right fantastic okay well that's been really awesome so thank you very much mel i'm just going to stop the recording now